Hi again. So today, I'm actually going to talk about current affairs after my little fake out last episode. But before I do, I want to give a content warning for anti Semitism, racism, fascism, and all sorts of horrible, bigoted stuff because all of that horrible stuff is going to come up. So, what item of current affairs are we going to look at? Well, I want to look at a debate which has opened up around free speech an idea which a lot of people on the right seem to be defending recently. And beyond that, is there really a free speech problem in Britain? Without a doubt. I mean, why shouldn't she have the right to deny the Holocaust? I personally am a free speech absolutist, so I think that any action you take is on you. A petition was created to be presented to Parliament asking them to repeal hate speech laws. Everyone's for free speech. Free speech is the mechanism by which we keep our society functioning. So it seems that a lot of people feel that anti-fascist protests, hate speech laws, and no platform tactics are all preventing people from speaking freely, from sharing their opinions, whatever they may be, from transphobia to outright anti-Semitism. Now I'm not against free speech, but I think limitations on hate speech are not an effort to repress free speech, but to protect it. Free speech is a great value, but to defend it, we must not just shout a surface theoretical reasoning of I can say whatever I like. Speech and its impacts are a bit more complex than that when applied in context. And, unfortunately, on the 27th of October 2018, that context was thrown into sharp relief. Heavily armed SWAT teams on the usually quiet suburban streets of Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At 10 a.m., a gunman, armed with an assault rifle and two pistols, opened fire inside the Tree of Life synagogue. Inside, up to 100 people gathered for a baby's naming ceremony. Responding teams shot and arrested him, but not before he'd killed at least 11 and wounded six others, including four police officers. This is the most horrific crime scene I've seen in 22 years with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Members of the Tree of Life synagogue conducting a peaceful service in their place of worship, were brutally murdered by a gunman targeting them simply because of their faith. American news agencies say this is a picture of the man in hospital under arrest. Robert Bowers, a 46-year-old with a history of posting anti-Semitic comments on social media. His most recent ominously signed off, I'm going in. There's a lot of anti-Semitism out there and there's a lot of hate up out there. You can just look in the news every day and uh, it's... It's sobering that it's touched our community. I know all these people. These are my community. This is my regular Saturday morning thing. Police have now stepped up patrols of other Jewish centers across the country. Too late for Squirrel Hill, a community which will forever be scarred by one man's violence. So, Robert Bowers gunned down 11 Jewish people outside the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh while shouting anti-Semitic slurs. This was a horrific tragedy and a disgusting act of bigoted violence, of racism and of anti-Semitism. In the aftermath, it became clear that, although Bauer's only previous police encounter was a speeding fine, he did have a long record of vitriolic racist posts against Jews and migrants on his social media, and most notably on a Twitter ripoff called Gab. Now, many people may not have heard of Gab, or at least not before these events, but it's long been known as a free speech platform favoured by right-wingers who want to post the things that get them kicked off Twitter. On Gab, Bowers had posted a range of horrific racist tweets, or gabs? Are they gabs if you're on Gab? I don't know. Anyway, he posted them on an account with a bio that read, Jews are the children of Satan. Here's some of them for you. Here he complains about Hyas, a Jewish group which helps refugees, saying that they are bringing invaders to dwell amongst us, and then ominously saying that he appreciates the list of friends that they have provided. Pretty chilling in light of what actually happened. Here he's retweeted someone called Brutal Honesty, who is calling for strong white leaders to act in the interests of his country, to stop them being outnumbered by non-whites, with a weird thing at the end about if you do this, we'll keep your family safe and wealthy, and we won't tell anyone about your trips to Lolita Island. And that is pretty creepy. 
And here he retweets someone saying that Jews are waging a propaganda war aimed at wiping out Western civilization, and that we'll be extinct in the next 200 years. Notice that a lot of these are retweets. This isn't just Bowers who is spouting this stuff here. He is being reinforced in his views by communicating with other people who share his fears about Jewish people and migrants, and his white supremacist ideology. And his final gab before the attack read, I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. So with the attack, attention was thrown onto Gab. At first they seemed creepily jubilant, boasting one million hits an hour all day. But then, just minutes later, PayPal banned them from processing transactions through their site. And shortly after, but still on the same day, Joyent, their hosting provider, pulled out of hosting Gab potentially leaving it offline for weeks. Apparently, they realised associating with a social network which has become a breeding ground for far-right terrorism is a bad look. Gab CEO and founder, Andrew Torber, then released an audio statement on their Twitter page which explicitly defends their site in terms of free speech. So let's see what they have to say. I'm going to look at Andrew Torber's statement after the event and his interview for NPR shortly afterwards, both of which he posted to Twitter. Links are in the description. Before I play this though, I'd like to mention, in his interview for NPR, Andrew says he and his family have received threats and abuse as a result of this news. And I haven't checked these claims, but if it is true, I'd like to make it clear I'm not here to justify that kind of behaviour. Have all the political discussions you like with people, but don't personally harass them, and definitely not their families. It's not an appropriate response. So, with that out of the way, let's see what he has to say. Sure. So I had seen what was going on uh, in Silicon Valley with the rise of censorship uh, during the 2015-2016 election cycle. Uh, I had personally experienced it myself across Reddit, Twitter, and other platforms. Uh, and I wanted to build an alternative to the big tech oligarchy, uh, the dominance that Silicon Valley has on online communication, information, and news. Uh, from day one, our mission has been very simple. It's been to defend free expression and individual liberty online for all people. And I think that it's important that uh, everybody has the right to speak freely. And everybody has the right to decide what type of content uh, they consume or, or want to consume or don't want to consume. I don't think it's right that two or three companies in Silicon Valley Two or three CEOs can decide uh, what is fake news and what isn't, uh, what we're allowed to talk about and what we're not allowed to talk about on the internet uh, for billions of people. They enforce unequally uh, towards one side of the political spectrum and not towards the other. Uh, you can see this in examples on Twitter, for example, where there are thousands upon thousands of people calling for someone to kill Donald Trump, saying they're going to kill Donald Trump, uh, expressing hate towards white people, towards Christians, towards minorities who may uh, now support Donald Trump. So I think they allow all these things to happen. Uh, they allow hate to be spewed at certain groups and certain people uh, while blocking it from another side. Torba says he founded Gab in response to the censorship of free speech by Silicon Valley. So we see here that Torba clearly felt a connection with right-wingers getting kicked off Twitter, and, as they were being kicked off Twitter, we can safely assume a lot of these people were posting racist, homophobic or sexist material or incitements to violence. So he made a space where they could say all these things without reproach. He even says he saw this effect himself, which implies perhaps he himself posted something that got him kicked off other social media platforms? Who knows? Regardless, he clearly shows his affinity with right-wing Twitter users and Trump supporters, and he even implies leftists don't get banned from Twitter, which is just not true. And unreasonable Twitter bannings is something that has been complained about from the left too. There are clearly some examples of over-policing on social media, but as I will argue, I don't think that racism or other forms of discrimination, as we see in Bauer's tweets, is included here. I think they should be removed. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So for now, let's just note it's clear from his statements that Andrew is here primarily concerned with the right-wing activists being kicked off. And those are clearly the clientele he's trying to attract to his new project, Gab. So that's why Gab was set up. So let's get on to his response to the Tree of Life synagogue attacks. 
folks, this is Andrew Torba, the co-founder and CEO of Gab.com. I want to make a statement on the Tree of Life synagogue shooting that occurred today. This disgusting and horrible tragedy, act of terrorism, uh, horrible display of brutality and violence that we unequivocally disavow and condemn. Our policy on terrorism and violence have always been very clear. We have a zero tolerance policy for it. We're very saddened and disgusted by the news of violence in Pittsburgh today, and we are keeping the families and friends of all the victims in our thoughts and in our prayers. We're refusing to be defined by media's narratives about GAP and about our community of almost 800,000 people from around the world. GAP's mission is very simple, and it always has been since we launched in August of 2016, and that is to defend free expression and individual liberty online for all people of all backgrounds. We have nothing but love for all people and freedom. We have consistently disavowed all violence. Free speech is actually crucial for the prevention of violence. If people cannot express themselves through words, they will do so through violence. Nobody wants that. So they seem to think that while Bauer's actions are deplorable, they should be immune from responsibility because all they did was support free speech and individual liberty. So what should they have done, in their view? The answer to bad speech is always going to be more speech. Censorship and pushing people into the shadows will never be the answer. It will only drive them to more violence because they cannot express themselves with words. Words do not kill people. The only answer is more speech? So his argument is that what Bauer did on his network was just free speech, so it's fine. It's just saying stuff. But then he did a bad thing, and that was bad. But if we spoke more, perhaps it wouldn't have been bad. Actions bad, speech good. Only answer, more speech. And Torba's idea that being allowed to speak prevents violence seems to be disproved by this very case. Bowers was allowed to speak on Gab, and yet he still committed an act of violence. I would argue that being able to speak in a community that is set up to reinforce your ideas actually increases the chances of an act of violence, rather than decreases it. And overall, I have to say, Andrew, I hate to be high and mighty about it, but this is a very simplistic and naive way of understanding how free speech functions in a society. The problem with a naive view on freedom of speech is it takes the surface words incredibly literally, rather than exploring the concept to see what its function is and how it can work in a nuanced, complex world. Freedoms come with responsibilities. My right to walk the streets doesn't give me the right to walk into someone's home uninvited. So is freedom of speech just the right to say stuff? What is freedom of speech aiming to protect? What function does it serve in a democratic society? And what responsibilities might it entail? The function of free speech is not just to let you go around saying the moon is made of cheese or something like that. It is to ensure that criticisms of the way the world is being run are not censored or pushed out of existence. It is a right to express unpopular views, criticism of the state and so on, and was brought about to prevent those in power from suppressing the right to speak of those without power. Rather like a free press, it serves as an attempt to ensure accountability of the powerful. But then, what if I want to say the moon is made of cheese? What if I should fervently believe in the cheesy essence of the lunar landscape? Well, let's look at that in context. If I believe this alone, this is probably not a problem except for me. I'll say the moon is made of cheese, and everyone will think I'm just that cheese-loving oddball who walks around chatting nonsense. But what if I convince others that it's made of cheese? And we come to believe that, actually, there's a conspiracy. The government is keeping the cheese from us by telling us there's no atmosphere on the moon. I suppose we're still only hurting ourselves. But we might worry about this irrational outbreak a bit. Still, maybe it's not so bad. But what if we then decide to form a political movement to take over government to force everyone to move to the moon for a better life with the cheese? And of course we won't wear any spacesuits because there's an atmosphere up there and we can just walk around eating the cheese. That might be a bit more dangerous, although it is a little ridiculous. Perhaps less ridiculous, we start committing political assassinations to try and get revenge for the cheese scheme. Then the speech has taken on another dimension. Now cheese belief isn't just neutral, a silly idea but it's a dangerous, irrational force looking to enact violence. The cheese discourse becomes a discourse in which damaging acts are irrationally justified. 
If this sounds bizarre and ridiculous, remember that a gunman once shot up a Washington pizza place because he heard on the internet Democrats ran a secret pedophile sex cult in its non-existent basement? So wild ideas can get out of hand. Okay, so the cheese example was a bit of fun, and Pizzagate was a bit niche. But what if you're someone who believes that Muslims and migrants want to destroy the West? Or that black people are genetically inferior? Or that Jews are plotting to wipe out your race? These two are irrational, unfounded positions which in themselves contain a motivation to violence, and that motivation becomes stronger the more widespread these discourses become. With outside authentication, even if it's not clear, comes greater support and greater force for these justifications. This was shown in the aftermath of Blair's legitimate concern speech, when a BMP councillor boasted that on the doorstep their concerns had been boosted to become the issue of the day, as well as by surges in violence against minorities following the Brexit vote in the UK and the election of Trump in the US. So, there is a definite spectrum between neutral and progressive speech and incitements to violence and appeals against reason. And while we want free speech, we don't want it to result in the spread of irrationality and violence. But legislating limitations on free speech like that is only something a crazy hyper-authoritarian state would do, right? Like Hitler or Stalin. Well, no. Restrictions on freedom of speech exist in most countries. You might recognise them. They include laws against libel, defamation and slander public obscenity and pornography, reprinting classified information, false claims on food labelling or adverts, public security, privacy, laws against perjury, and of course, laws against inciting violence or hate speech. But note, this is not just in contexts of protecting minorities. If I sit down and plan to murder you with a friend with full intent to do it, this is conspiracy to murder. It is illegal speech, even though I've not yet killed anyone. To use the language referenced earlier, we could see this as the responsibility for you not to use your free speech to abuse people, spread falsehoods, and so on. I'm not saying that all restrictions on speech are enacted well in our society here, just trying to show that in almost any view of free speech, there are rational limitations to the extent of that speech. But Torba disagrees. He says he is defending the First Amendment and the universal right to free speech. Unfortunately for Torba, this doesn't quite work out when you actually look at these documents. The First Amendment explicitly uses the definite article, the, for freedom of speech, which is commonly held to differentiate a pure free speech from the specific sort of free speech accepted at the time, to allow for the due limitations on speech I mentioned before, like perjury and defamation, which is obviously how hate speech laws can even exist in the US. Andrew may disagree. But is banning harassment for race, gender, or sexuality really any more of a restriction on speech than banning any other kind of harassment? Harassment does harm, and there's no reason it shouldn't be limited, just as we limit other harmful speech like perjury or libel. So what about the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Surely that has a pure notion of free speech like Andrew would want? No. It also limits free speech. It states, under Article 19, that everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference, and everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media of his choice. However, those free speech smashing liberals must have got their hands on it, as the version of Article 19 in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights later amends this by stating that the exercise of these rights carries special duties and responsibilities, and may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, when necessary, for respect of the rights or reputation of others, for the protection of national security or public order, or of public health or morals. These limitations aren't because the world is run by crazy censors, although I'm not saying that there aren't some limitations on free speech in the West which are extreme, But limitations of the sort we're discussing here are not extreme by definition. Restricting the ability of people to lie publicly about each other, to plot to harm each other, to lie to court, 
or not to harass each other is just part of making functional use of the principle of free speech. So if you're one of these self-declared free speech extremists... I personally am a free speech absolutist, so I think that any action you take is on you. And you believe in no restrictions on speech whatsoever. You are saying, I can lie about you in the press? Publicly put pornographic images of you in front of your kids, because privacy is not a thing either. Print your medical records on a billboard and stick it outside your house. Or plan to murder you, or given the public security clause, plan a terror operation in which you and many others would die. And none of it becomes culpable, because it's just speech, man. It only becomes a crime after the action. Torba actually tries to use this reasoning to defend Gab saying that their forum was actually helpful because it allows you to retrospectively place blame. There is one person responsible for the horrific, horrific events that occurred today, and that is allegedly Mr. Bowers. Because he was on Gab, law enforcement now had definitive evidence for a motive. They would not have had this evidence without Mr. Bowers being on Gab. We are proud to work with and support law enforcement in order to bring justice to this alleged terrorist. They condemn Robert Bauer's actions and praise themselves for giving his record straight to the police and FBI, and go on to claim it was good he spoke on their platform and left a clear record of his motive. Although he was apparently shouting anti-Semitic slurs as he fired, so I don't think the motive was unclear. All this implies that the speech was fine. It only had to be controlled and reported afterwards to be well dealt with, when 11 people are already dead. But this isn't just about his speech. What about the festering pool of other racist and bigoted speech they allowed to perpetuate on their forum, which reinforces and radicalizes people with these beliefs? They're not just protecting the right to think and say these things privately, they are creating a platform for people to say these things unpoliced to a boasted 800 million people. As such, their platform did not just free him to have his speech, but freed him to communicate and organize with others to find a community that would enable him, and to feel he would be supported and justified in going out and committing these acts. If speech is not culpable, even when communicating ideas which inherently have violent intentions, like Bauer's hard racist views, that means we can never prevent atrocities like this before they happen. Someone says they're going to blow up a building, just speech. They do it, now there's a crime. Someone says they think all Jews should be driven out, just speech. They go and shoot up a synagogue, and yeah, you can respond. But 11 people are dead. To be fair, Torba does respond to this by suggesting the police should moderate his network for him if they want to catch crooks. Let these people be exposed. Let law enforcement have a, a documented record to be able to track these people and see what they're saying uh, before they take action so that law enforcement can take preemptive action and watch for red flags, things of this nature. That won't exist if you no platform these people off the internet. This seems a little contradictory when his big stance is on criminalizing freedom of speech. To ask the state to come in and fully criminalize the speech on your network, so people get arrested and not just banned from forums, sounds a bit contradictory to their stated aims. After this, he points out that there was no direct threat in the Gab post before the attack. I, I don't know, do you see a direct threat in there? Because I don't. What, what would you expect us to do with a post like that? You, you, you want us to just censor anybody that says the phrase, I'm going in? Is that what you're proposing here? And he points out that Gab has got rules against inciting violence. Uh, you know, we have very common sense rules. We do not allow threats of violence. We don't allow spam. We don't allow doxing, posting someone's private information without their consent. And obviously we don't allow illegal activity, like child pornography. I agree. There was no threat in the Gab post, or at least none that could be directly actionable. And yes, you have rules against violent threats and so on, but this is not the point. By selling your service as a free speech space for hate speech, you allow a community to form which reinforces that hate speech, and the larger that community gets, the more people will feel justified in doing extreme things because they feel there are more people who support them. We see this in the rise of right-wing terror attacks in the US, Canada, the UK, as well as other European countries, including parcel bombs sent to black citizens in Austin, Texas, the incel attacks in Canada and the US, 
The murder of Joe Cox, a British Labour MP, in the run-up to the Brexit referendum by a man using a homemade gun from instructions he found in an international fascist magazine. A van that drove into Muslims outside Finsbury Park Mosque in London, the driver of which allegedly originally wanted to use it to assassinate the left-wing leader Jeremy Corbyn. But when he couldn't find him, he decided to kill some Muslims instead. Pipe bombs sent to high-profile Democratic Party figures in the US and terror attacks by various groups on German refugee housing. This is only naming a very small sample of the many recent violent acts committed by far-right groups. This is a culture that has become widespread and has built connections through online forums like Gap and worked to promote hateful and violent ideas and to indoctrinate others with them. And you can see the free speech of this movement in full force at places like Charlottesville. Did Hitler do anything wrong? No! I love my people! One more! One more! One more! I want everybody to be at me, take close attention. Because this is the first precept of the true alt-right. Remember it. Gas the kites, race war now! Gas the kites, race war now! Gas the kites, race war now! Sweet Paul! Sweet Paul! Who brought the ovens? <laughs> and remember, after the events shown there, Heather Heyer, an anti-fascist activist, was killed by a white supremacist who drove his car into a crowd of protesters. Again, I'm not saying I agree with all restrictions on free speech, and ensuring the possibility of criticism of power from below is important, but when it comes to these examples, I think it's pretty clear that there are certain speech limitations we all recognise as legitimate. This is not a black and white area. There isn't just good speech and bad speech. It's a sea of grey which must be navigated carefully in each context to determine what kinds of speech are and are not protected. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, the issues with this naive, pure, literal interpretation of the words freedom of speech are sufficiently obvious that it has long been a topic of philosophical discussion, and we're already equipped with a number of concepts to help us make these judgments. The liberal philosopher J.S. Mill, in his book On Liberty, is a very strong advocate of free speech, stating, If all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. This all seems very straightforward, but limitations are still attached. Mill's entire text in On Liberty is contextualised with what he calls one very simple principle, the harm principle. He says, The sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number, is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community, against his will, is to prevent harm to others. So, speech and other liberties can, for Mill, be restricted to prevent harm. This is one of the simplest responses, and it seems pretty good. As a general principle it works, but of course, morality is always full of traps and grey areas. Some judgement always has to serve a statement like this, such as, what is harm? In the past, people said discussing gay people or other queer sexualities in front of children was a harm. But I think that's an important part of having an open, accepting society where people can express their individual liberty. The cultural context can define harm in ways which may be problematic. But I still think it's not a completely useless idea. And it still lets us say that conspiracy to do harm is a limit on free speech. While there are grey areas here, I do also want to note that hate speech is not a grey area for this principle. Hate speech is a type of speech which incites harm against minorities. So I'm sorry, all you would-be classical liberals out there. I might not be his biggest fan overall myself, particularly not of his economic stance, but J.S. Mill does not support your campaign to free hate speech. So the harm doctrine while it seems to point in a reasonable direction, seems less clear than we might like. So how can we add some more content to this than just the notion of harm, to make it clearer? Well, a more nuanced account is offered by Karl Popper, 
Again, he's not a philosopher I'm in full agreement with, but he has a good point here. He also once famously criticised Wittgenstein for gesturing aggressively with a poker during a debate on the existence of philosophical problems, which is irrelevant here, but it's a fun anecdote and I recommend looking it up if you're into 1940s philosophy gossip. Popper looked at the notion of tolerance, of which free speech is clearly an example, and said that there had to be limitations on tolerance. So much for the tolerant left, eh? Well, actually no. Popper famously pointed out that unrestricted tolerance would destroy itself if its tolerance extended to tolerating intolerance. He discussed this, calling it the paradox of tolerance, in his book The Open Society and Its Enemies. As he said, Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed, and tolerance with them. In this formulation, I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies. As long as we can counter them by rational argument, and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be unwise. But we should claim the right to suppress them, if necessary, even by force. For it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument, but begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive, and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols. We should therefore claim, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant, and we should consider incitement to intolerance as criminal, in the same way we should consider incitement to murder, or to kidnapping, or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. And in the context, it's a bit telling that he refers to people moving their arguments over to fists or pistols there. So what does this mean in practice? Well, you have a tolerant society, a place where individuals have the liberty to express themselves, because like Andrew, I also like individual liberty. Someone comes along who doesn't like some of the people. Maybe they're brown, or maybe they use their individual liberty to sleep with people that that person doesn't like, or to present as a gender they think is wrong. So they're alone, and the tolerant society is fine. But if they organise to take power, they are then able to limit speech and enact violence that ends this tolerance. When people question the intolerance of this group, they become targets of intolerance and are also eliminated. And intolerance spreads like so. This is why actively discriminatory groups like Nazis, Islamophobic racists, homophobes and transphobes should not be allowed to gain mass platforms to spread their ideas. I'm not saying we need a thought police controlling what people individually think is neither desirable nor ethical but by allowing intolerant and hateful belief systems a platform to expand on the basis of tolerance, we are not defending tolerance. We are opening a gap for them to destroy it. To put this in free speech terms, intolerance is the enemy of free speech, as those not tolerated are prevented from speaking. So, if we value a tolerant society, we must be ready to prevent major organised intolerance. Many on the right are actively well aware of this. They regularly choose this tactic to make that opening to undermine free speech, not because they are sincere defenders of free speech. This, perhaps, is the optics Bowers referred to, attempts by the right to hide their violent and oppressive agenda. And free speech is, for many on the right, just that, not a value, but a tactic to use to mask their true intentions. Look at how Richard Spencer discusses his view on it. Everyone's for free speech. Oh, sorry Richard, I meant that other video where you actually say what you think. Uh, but as far as government regulation, I mean, yes, I think in the short term, we would favor government regulation of speech, but long term, uh, are we even pro free speech? No, of course not. But we have to use this platform in order. So we're, we're being radically honest here. And, yes, yeah. radically pragmatic. Oh, dear, Richard. Looks like you've been telling some little lies to make yourself look better, haven't you? Everyone's for free speech. Are we even pro-free speech? No, of course not. Everyone's for free speech. Are we even pro-free speech? No, of course not. And this is not new. Here we see classic British fascist Oswald Mosley, whose black shirts militated in Britain in the 30s, culminating notably in the Battle of Cable Street where they attempted to march through a major Jewish area of London, and were prevented by an organised community backed by anti-fascist demonstrators. And I'm not using the word fascist here lightly, or just to denote something that I disagree with. 
he was literally the head of an organization called the British Union of Fascists. So the term is absolutely 100% appropriate here. He is trying to make the same arguments we see on the right today, although pleasingly, it seems he has much more trouble getting away with it. Notice how, while talking about free speech, he uses his platform speech to try and shout down detractors and avoid their arguments, and how his use of free speech is to avoid responding to their more damaging points and turn the argument onto a territory in which he feels like he can look better. In the past about various things whom I don't fight today. The folly is to continue a fight when the reason for the fight is over. Yes, but I have why no quarrel you... with them for being Jews. That's why I'm not an anti semite But why in that case did you condone uh, all the violence that was practiced by your supporters in the 30s against Jews now, going down into the East End? Now, wait a moment. Let's look at that very closely. What meetings of other people were ever broken up by our people? It was our meetings were attacked. I'd had the largest But meeting. you went down and held meetings in Jewish areas no. in the East End. You marched through Jewish areas. No. Provocation. That's been stated again and again and is quite untrue. Anybody... No. Some... Well, all right, I challenge. I challenge. Can you turn a camp... All day provocation. And it right, was 200,000 East Londoners that stopped you marching through all day. March through the dockers, the clothing workers, the shop assistants stopped you, and even the biggest police force they could muster couldn't push you through. Why did they we beat you then, as we will beat you again, and we beat your friend Adolf Hitler. But we were our predecessors. Can we just of, of move? Those abuse, can we just move this camera here a bit to one side so that? Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, but so that uh, Sir Oswald can see the person. Well, I was not bringing in the public. Right, right, just the gentleman finishing. I the was front. making the point. Mosley at the moment tries to present himself as sweet and reasonable. He's not anti-Semitic. Here's a picture of him in 1962, with the leader of the neo-Nazi party in Germany rapidly calling for a redivision of frontiers, the leader of the Belgian fascists, the leader of the Italian fascists, and a face, this was published in your fascist paper, that's blacked out or whited out. There it is. Who is this mystery man that you weren't prepared to show in your own paper? A war criminal? You are now busy going around Europe trying to rebuild your crooked cross international. You failed once, but you hope that the revival of German Nazis in Western Germany, the old gang coming out of their holes again, will give you another opportunity, even though you're an old, decaying element in this country. Just, okay, just a moment, let's... And there's a picture of him, yeah, okay, sweet and reasonable, look at it. Look okay, at it, yeah, trying just, to preach to the people of East London. Yeah, just a minute, let, him, up let him answer. Oh. Well now, you've had your speech, can I, I say a few words in reply? Now, it's divided into two parts, your question. First of all, you say I'm in alliance with anti-Semitic elements in Europe. And secondly, you say I held provocative or bullying marches through East London. I'll answer the first point first. None of the men in that uh, uh, photograph are anti-Semites or ever have been. None of them. None of those parties. None of them. They've all specifically disclaimed it. Every single one of the men in that picture have declared against anti-Semitism and what you say is completely untrue. So now I will take, now I will take... Hitler was an anti-Semite, yeah. but you were his ally. No, no, I was not his ally. And, you said and I'll, I'll deal with that. No, I was you've not. you never said one yeah. word about the... Now, now you see why we had to, now. now you see how we had to fight for free speech. When you show, when you show pictures of me, when you show pictures of me in uniform, it was because men like you came by the score to our meetings, enormous meetings like that in Exhibition Hall, London, 30,000 people uh, coming to listen to us, which was in perfect order, because we'd stop people like you breaking up the meetings. And I did that with the Black Shirt Movement, and I'm proud to have organized and led the Black Shirt Movement to restore free speech to Britain. Frost. Heckling is part of the British tradition. Yes. And, until, and until Heckling, but not until, shouting down, until which is what you are doing. Shouting no down. Hitler had ever been beaten and kicked and had bones broken and sent off to hospital. Never. Not since the no. ancient time. But no. you started a fashion that you learned from your friend Adolf Hitler. You thought the now you want to make just a, just a minute, just a minute, let him answer. Could you want to bring the meeting, as your friends often tried before, to a close and stop the speaker, either of the speakers, having their say. 
And that is why we organized to put people like you out when you denied free speech in Britain. And it was a right and proper thing to do. And they were magnificent young men and I'm proud to have led and organized them to put people like you out of meetings. And since, yes, there you are, you will not allow other people to speak. And you are doing here what you've always done, denying free speech to other people. And that is precisely why I put the people like you out of our meeting. And I do it again. While I don't know about Torba personally, Gab, it seems, do have secret agendas behind their racism too, organized through a Discord chat server called Gabba Hangout. Information on this is being posted by the website Unicorn Riot, and is worth checking out. Here's one choice example where they've turned a picture of the car that murdered Heather Heyer at Charlottesville into a DeLorean, with the caption, Back to the Fuhrer, which is particularly disgusting. And if this is not dangerous hate speech, with the clear potential to incite violence, which celebrates murder and terrorism and fascism, then I don't know what is. But there's a lot of other really disturbing images revealed on the Unicorn Riot article, so check it out if you like feeling really sick. So, through Popper, we can see how free speech not only can reasonably exclude hate speech such as we see in forums like Gab, but also how excluding the speech before it becomes too powerful, i.e. before it becomes more than speech, can be really important. However, Torba suggests this sort of action to prevent the organising of the right would be no platforming. Of course, this is exactly what's happening to his site, as the owners of its infrastructure withdraw their services because they don't want to help perpetuate a site which is mostly associated with spreading hate speech. Gab is the most censored and no-platformed social network on the planet. Gab is the banned book of the internet. And Gab is going to keep building. We will not cower. We are not afraid of the mainstream media attacks on us. We will keep building. Now, no platforming is a little bit different than just restricting free speech. It's not censorship as such, it's denying a platform, and platforms go beyond simple speech. Free speech may allow for privately held beliefs, even if they're abhorrent, but platforms are not just places people speak, they are also places that communicate speech to others, allowing the person to convert others to their beliefs and organise with them to act on them. Again, this is fine with normal ideas but with ideas that are inherently violent and trying to cause harm, this is a dangerous thing. Also, no platforming is rarely a state intervention, but generally an intervention from below, to take a stand against speech that is harmful, not by criminalising it, but by using the freedom of speech of a large group of people to overrule the speech of the individual who is making hateful comments. You'd think Torba would favour this, as he says the answer to bad speech is more speech. Isn't this what you wanted, Andrew? Hey, here it is. But no, the amassed voices of many people opposing someone's speech, that's a restriction on speech, actually, in his view. Again, this is not about policing their opinion. It's about preventing them from having a public platform to spread it further. This is the reason the left often use no platforming as a tactic. And while I think a nuanced discussion about how no platform functions in the current environment is needed, I think it is often still a useful tactic. Also, No platform is not an evasion of debate, it's an attempt to stem the flow of hateful ideas to the public. Debates against the far right can be done well sometimes. I think Christy Winter's debate with Sargon is a good example here. But they are incredibly risky. The right don't care about truth in the way much the left does and are willing to make dishonest claims and use dishonest tactics to get easy wins and to divert your points. And unless you truly and solidly wipe the floor with them, their supporters will often see even a defeat as a victory. The fact that you're right often doesn't matter against an opportunistic opponent willing to mould their ideas to make them seem more acceptable and to disown their worst values if publicly challenged on them, as we saw Richard Spencer and Oswald Mosley do earlier. Also, giving them a platform gives the impression that their views are appropriate to be discussed on that platform. This is particularly a consideration for universities, where allowing people with unreferenced views based on lies and misrepresentations that would not pass peer review to debate with peer-reviewed academics gives the impression that these ridiculous stances are worthy of competing on a level playing field with academic works. Personally, I think it's better to critique them in a separate forum, like we're doing here, so as to avoid being drawn from your point and to give a clear critique of their views. 
No platforming is therefore not an evasion of debate, but a tactic to prevent that debate from being used as a recruiting tool by those who spread intolerance. With Popper, we can see why this is essential, as allowing intolerance to spread will eventually end the regime of tolerance. Again, I want to say, this is not an argument against free speech, but for the proper use of speech in response to hate and the proper moderation of public platforms to prevent the spread of bigoted views which would threaten the safety of people for no reason other than their belonging to some or other group that is being irrationally demonised. By platforming these views under the guise of free speech, you are in fact giving cover to those who would seek to forever destroy free speech. There is one obvious objection here. Why just gab? Am I not being a little unfair laying all of this at their door? Why not other social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook too? Torba makes this point himself. Okay, and anti-Semites are also on Facebook, they're also on Twitter, they're also on Reddit, they're also on Snapchat. And what? Why, why are you not calling out Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and Snapchat for the anti-Semitism on the platform? So yes, it's true these people operate across social media and it's difficult to police and other platforms should be held to account for it. And they have been, which is why many platforms now do at least try to run proper moderation, successfully or not, on their platforms, and why we have report abuse buttons and so on. But if you refuse to regulate racist or bigoted behaviour, you allow it to become normalised and create conditions for it to go further. And it seems a bit insincere of Torba to say that his website is like Facebook or Twitter in this respect. As he explicitly says in the same interview that the reason he set up Gab was to avoid censorship on these platforms, by which he means their efforts to moderate this sort of speech. Proper moderation of public spaces is essential to allowing members of the public to safely use it. Online forums should prevent abusive behaviour like racism, sexism, transphobia and homophobia to protect the safety of users and, as we have just examined, society. Gab didn't cause the problem. They're not the only problematic service out there, but their touting of their site as a safe space for hate speech has allowed a toxic community to grow, which they have not tried to restrict, and for this reason they do stand out for particular criticism. I can already hear another objection coming. You're a leftist, you deem nine is the rich, or you want to kill them, or something on those lines. I am a leftist, and I am critical of capitalism for the way it exploits people. But the solution I offer is not demonising the wealthy or the arbitrary elimination of capitalists by violent slaughter, but a change in economic system to better distribute wealth, one that would guarantee rather than threaten human survival. In my ideal system, the people I disagree with still get to live in it, which, sadly, is not generally the case in far-right, authoritarian, fascist regimes. Speaking of regimes, while boasting of his 800 million users in the NPR interview, Andrew proudly claims that he has had a large influx of Brazilian users in the past few months, and anyone following Brazilian politics will know that this is probably because of the rise of Brazil's new extreme far-right president, Bolsonaro, a man who uses his speech to endorse torture against domestic dissidents, prefers the old dictatorship to democracy, and said just before his election he wants a cleansing such as Brazil has never seen. He was elected three days ago at time of writing, and here's just one thing we've seen surrounding this election. More than 20 Brazilian universities were invaded by military police, interrupting classes and destroying anti-fascist literature and banners and slogans. So much for free speech. Here we see the right in power using the military to invade seats of learning to shut down dissent. This again shows how, just as Popper said, Tolerating intolerance leads to the end of the regime of tolerance, to actual attacks on free speech to shut down the criticism of a leader who may very well be a tyrant. So to sum up, free speech is an essential value in society. The ability of people to question their societies and governments and organise against them is essential to a functioning democracy, but to tolerate philosophies of intolerance is not a logical conclusion of free speech. It is in fact the very thing that would destroy it. I am not arguing that all restrictions on speech are good. Far from it. I think we should eradicate as much censorship as possible. And I'm not saying this isn't an idea that will forever throw up problems and grey areas, or that can only be used positively. But I am saying that any theory of free speech will have some limitations. And unless you want to enable all the worst of human behaviour, you have to engage with them and constantly work to improve them. I would also say that most, if not all, analyses of these limitations would put speech that threatens whole groups of people based on race, gender status, 
religion, sexuality, or any of these arbitrary categories, bang in the middle of the sort of thing that must be restricted to protect free speech for everyone and avoid harm. And yes, to do this, we may have to deny platforms to speak to people with these abhorrent, intolerant views, whether by collective action, because I do agree that more speech, if it's the right speech, can be a good response to bad speech, in some cases, but also through preventing them from being able to communicate their ideas, through examples like maybe taking their servers down or no longer processing payments for them, like has happened in this situation. And yeah, I don't think that anyone was wrong to do that. In fact, I think by doing that, they were helping to preserve freedom of speech for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. I've mostly looked at the speech of people on Gab and people of their viewpoints here. But whose voices do they exclude? Let's bring this back to the actual event. Eleven people died. Eleven people who were given no chance to account for their lives, to argue their case, to plead for their existence. No, they were killed by a man based on a hatred that had been allowed to fester and reinforce itself in communities like Gab. He had his speech, and so did those that helped back up his ideas. And he killed 11 people. Not for their speech or actions, but just because they happened to be Jewish. Where was their speech? Where was their right to respond to this vicious anti-Semitism? They will never speak again. The more hate speech and these bigoted ideas permeate the public discourse, the more of a chilling effect it has on the speech of those who this speech attacks. In this way, it's never about free speech. It's about whose speech you are platforming. Are you platforming the speech of the bigots, or are you platforming the speech of those who they would make their victims? I think it's worth noting here that some people who did think about this community, controversially, I'm sure, to many who believe the lies of the right, was the Muslim community. The Islamic Center of Pittsburgh raised over $70,000 to help the victims and the families of those slain and gave a statement of support, even offering to defend the synagogue if need be. Their leader said, We just want to know what you need. You know, if it's more money, let us know. If it's people outside your next service protecting you, let us know. We'll be there. If you need organizers on the ground, we'll provide them. If you need food for the families, if you just need someone to come to the grocery store because you don't feel safe in the city, we'll be there. And I'm sure everybody in the room would say the same thing. We're here for the community. And that sort of solidarity is, I think, really what being there for a community is. Not policing the lines that divide us, or seeking some kind of purity, ethnic or otherwise, but working together to overcome the struggles of our lives and make them easier for all of us. When we allow people to spread and reinforce hateful ideas, when we give platforms specifically designed to allow these racist views to be openly shared, we aren't defending free speech. We are defending the rights to speak of the racists and the bigots at the expense of the rights of their victims. And eventually, if we let it get out of hand, more and more of the people targeted by the hate speech will become victims. And, as is all too clear from history, the logical conclusion of these hateful worldviews is mass murder and genocide. Tolerating the promotion of hate speech is about as much an ideal of free speech as tolerating the right of paedophiles to promote their actions. It is prioritizing the right of the violent to speak and spread their violence over the rights of the people that they threaten to be free from harm and harassment. And, in the worst cases, it takes their right to live. Okay, so this is only my second video. And it has got quite long, but there was a lot I wanted to talk about on this topic, so it just ended up as long as it is. Let me know in the comments if you think that the length is good or bad. That would be interesting to know. And I'd like to mention that while recording this video, I got the news that Gab is actually now back online, so all you free speech activists out there who definitely won't have listened this far in this video, well, good for you guys. I'd also like to make some special thanks to the YouTuber ThoughtSlime, who's given me some really nice promotion since my last video came out, and who gave me this very nice tweet, which I'm going to show for you here. I'd like to thank my animator, at Blue Legenda, 
and to point out that I do now have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash dumpsterflower. So if you want to give me some money on there, that would be great. Unfortunately, we do live under capitalism, and making these videos takes quite a lot of time, particularly when they get this long. So if you can give me any money to help me out with that, like feeding myself and stuff, that would be great. And if you're into that sort of thing, you can get your name in the credits and all that sort of thing. But anyway, thank you for listening. Like, share, and subscribe, and all of those things. They're good things to do. And, yeah. See you next time. Goodbye.